All right, it's morning huddle time. Good morning. Wish you, no, I'm not saying it works. I wish you I'm God speed. I, I God speed with all of that. I think that's really, really nice. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure what kind of success you're going to have with that today because the world, my friend, has changed. Right. Latin right. American construction workers, they have different needs. They have completely different These needs. These awards have a huge... Um, like criteria that you have to fill out, and they usually have a community service or community relations portion. Makes them, uh, you know, the most productive uh, with a high performance value, um, and you know, sometimes it's eleven o'clock at night. Yeah. Funny, isn't? Uh, yeah, I've not not for me. Not for uh, me. At eleven o'clock, I am guaranteed to be snoring. So, so. <laughs> um, Good morning. It's morning huddle time. I'm Chad Prinky. Uh, I am remote today, working from a hotel. Hopefully, my my internet access holds up. Uh, I'm with uh, Stacy Holzinger as always. Stacy, how are you this morning? I'm doing good, and I'll stay on just in case. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Stacy's here to have my back in case the internet in Kansas City fails. Uh, yeah. So. Um, uh, and we have today with us our guest, Jackson Nichols. Jackson, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Chad. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's great to have you here. So Jackson's a construction attorney. I'm going to let him uh, provide a little bit of, of context for sort of who he is and, and how he got to, to where he is. But um, I, I've known Jackson, Stacy and I have both known Jackson for several years uh, as a um, you know a go-to resource for contractors in in the DC metro area uh, when it comes to all things legal, trying to navigate the the you know changes and challenges that they all face. Um, Jackson, maybe if you would give us give us a minute or so of context on who you are, um, how you got to where you are, and and you know uh, where where your point of view might be coming from. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Chad. So um, my name is Jackson Nichols. I'm in a, I'm with the law firm of Cohen Saglius, uh, Palace Greenhall and Furman. Um, I am originally from, uh, I'm a North Carolina native, born and raised in Raleigh, uh, moved to D.C. Uh, in the late 2000s after law school. And I've been here ever since practicing law since 2006. Uh, I've been focusing mostly on construction law since 2015. Um, and uh, I practice in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. We have a lot of owners, contractors, GCs, and subs, and pretty much anyone in the industry that we represent. Um, and, you know, my law firm is a national practice, mostly concentrated in the mid-Atlantic region, the Northeast. Uh, but we represent people in the construction industry all over. And like you said, there's a lot of changes. There's a lot of challenges in the industry. And um, sometimes we're in court duking it out. Uh, and sometimes we're kind of behind the scenes helping people with strategy and figuring out, you know, what to do with the latest challenge. Uh, if, if, I, if I can speak for uh, every owner of every contractor that I know, uh, being in court duking it out is definitely the last thing we want to be doing. Um, but it's really nice uh, to have somebody that <laughs> can help you to do it if, you, if it absolutely has to happen. Yeah, um, that's that's definitely true. And we that's always our goal is to avoid litigation. Um, there are times when you don't really have any choice. And there's some times where you have to uh, credibly threaten that you're willing to go all the way, even if the dollars are not quite there to make sense for that. But same risk calculus for the other side. So, you know, but you want you want to stay out of court because it's expensive. Yeah, yeah, it's expensive. And, and um, uh, you know, I think also a crazy distraction, right? Like it, you're, you need to be building stuff. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be sitting in court uh, litigating the past, you know, if yeah. you can possibly avoid it. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, it's not just the dollars that ties up your resources. It ties up, it's, it's an emotional toll on people. I mean, litigation just gets very all consuming um, and, you know, you can delegate it if you're the owner of a company to like the project manager who is involved in that project and, you know, they're taking care of a lot of it, but it's still going to be hanging over you. Uh, and usually for a long time, I mean, it takes a long time for the whole process to play out. And, you know, we always try to get our clients to 
um, you know, settle cases where it makes sense and, you know, get a, get a good deal and get out and move on with doing what you do, which is construction. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I, I, I've got, uh, all kinds of questions. Let's, let's, let's dive into this thing. And, um, you know, I, I think from a starting point, I would just like to ask what are the, what are the reasons let's go, go all the way into litigation for a minute. You know, what are the reasons, what are the most common reasons that we're in court? Just it probably seems like an obvious answer, but I, I want to hear, you know, fr from a professional on it. Uh, what, what, what's the number one reason that we end up in court? Well, in, you know, as far as my practice with representing construction companies, usually it's a dispute over money. Um, sometimes they're going to be, uh, seeking to obtain something called injunctive relief. Um, you might try to, you know, get a, a lien bonded off or something like that. Um, but usually you're fighting it out over money and that could be a fairly simple contract balance dispute. Um, it, but they can get pro progressively more complex, uh, you know, change orders, scope disputes, um, that's getting a little more complicated, um, a little more factually intensive. Uh, then you might have construction defects. Uh, you might have a delay claim or delay schedule related type of dispute um, that's getting on the kind of higher end of complexity. Yeah. Yep. That makes total sense. And I mean, it, you know, at the end of the day, uh, those different circumstances that you talked about do come down to money, but we're probably not arguing over money if there's not something a little bit more nebulous or, you know, um, complex at uh, the heart of the issue. Because if it were as simple as you owed me X, you didn't pay me Y, you know, uh, we probably wouldn't end up in litigation, <laughs> right? So, so the the circumstances that really I would imagine end up in litigation are the ones where um, each party feels they have a legitimate claim to to their position, right? Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes you have to make a business decision, but uh, sometimes parties can get dug in a little bit on their positions because they know they're right about something um, and they know that the other side is just kind of jerking them around and they don't appreciate that. Um, and so you, it's, it's a tough tightrope you have to walk sometimes because you, you want to make sure you're being a good business owner and you're, you're doing what's the best, what's in the best interest of your company as far as the dollars. And sometimes, you know, you've got a $80,000 contract balance claim and that's not nothing but that's uh, not worth paying a lawyer for over a year to pursue. Um, so, you know, people do get their emotions involved in it. And that, that's, that's a factor. Um, and, you know, there's, but there's also a rational component to that as well. I think you want to create a moral hazard sometimes. And it's, sometimes it's worth it to say, hey, we're not someone that can get pushed around out there. Right. Yeah. I mean, and that, that is one of the things that is kind of special about the construction industry. It's probably not the only industry where this is the case, but uh, certainly not all industries are, are the same in that the construction industry is one in which you're going to be doing business with the same people, with the same sort of, uh, you know, folks um, f from, uh, from year to year, from decade to decade, these people and unless you're a traveling contractor that's all, you know all over the all over the country or the world, the the majority of contractors are you know local presence. They build a certain kind of building, and if they're working with owner X or or general contractor X today, they're going to end up working with probably those same humans, if not those same companies again in the future. So so that's an interesting take like that that that. Um, you know, uh, comment that you sometimes you need to, you're making an investment just to kind of prove that you can't be pushed around. Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely true. And um, because of the, you know, very integrated nature of the industry and how it can be very uh, local a lot of times um, and kind of where you're doing your work, uh, that is a big factor sometimes that we take into account when we're deciding whether or not to, you know, push forward past just a demand letter stage. Do we want to really file a lawsuit against this company when, or do we want to lean this project when we think we, we've got another project with them or we want to get more business from them? I mean, that, that usually uh, kind of informs your decision and might make you decide a little earlier, okay, well, let's just take, you know, 
70 cents on the dollar here instead of 90 and right. just kind of cut a deal because we'll be seeing these people again. And, you know, people talk in the industry too. You don't want to be that contractor that's tough, that gets a reputation for being tough to work with. And, you know, everybody has to do horse trading from time to time. That's kind of the project management process a lot of times. Yeah. Um, let's start to walk backwards now. Like how do we end up here, <laughs> you know, and, and how do we, and how do we keep ourselves, um, from actually experiencing the, you know, the level of dispute that rises to the question of should we actually press forward into litigation? So, so at, from, from the very start, the, the moment I'm, I'm imagining that leads to, um, you know, that triggers the first recognition of a potential problem is that moment when you were supposed to be paid and you're not being paid. Um, or yeah, let's focus on that one because I'm guessing there are, you know, I, I know there are a few others, but let's focus on that instant. Um, you know, you should be paid on something and you're not being paid on it. How quickly would you raise the alarm that, you know, we don't need to just uh, wait, but we need to be proactive and communicate and say, hey, what's going on? We're supposed to be getting paid. I, I It's a great question. And I, I think if you asked uh, different construction attorneys, they'd all give you a slightly different, but holistically, mostly the same answer. Um, you don't want to wait too long and your decision needs to be informed by what are the, uh, what, first of all, what's the language in the contract, um, your, your construction contract, whether it's your, your GC and it's your contract with the owner, or you're a subcontractor, it's your subcontract with the GC, your supplier, the purchase order, whatever. Um, second, you're going to really want to know whatever state you're in for that project, what are the other kind of statutory protections that are there uh, for someone who's for a construction contractor who's trying to get paid. Right. So you have usually there's going to be very kind of um, specific uh, timing deadlines that are going to vary a lot from one state to the next. Um, and most of those are if it's your general rule of thumb, if it's a public project, it's going to be a bond claim. And your timing is usually going to be 90 days from the last day you did any work. Um, if it's a private project, then it's probably going to be a lien claim, a mechanics lien that you could file because that gives you extra leverage beyond just the, uh, you know, your breach of contract lawsuit, which you can generally file within a longer period of time. But when you're the downstream contractor, you're, you're, you don't have that extra leverage. Um, and those statutory enforcement mechanisms, lien claims, bond claims, that gives you an upper hand where because usually the contract is stacked against you. And because the terms of the contractor tend to be less favorable for you, um, there's you know been a long time recognition in the industry that um, legislatures need to step in and level the playing field a little more. Um, so that's why you have lien claims and those can vary pretty widely in the timing. Um, so I would, you know, for, for instance, uh, Maryland says you have to file a notice of a lien claim, not a file, file you just send it to the uh, other side um, and to the owner within 120 days of your last day of work. So, um, you know, that's a slightly longer period. Uh, Virginia, it's, you know, it varies depending on whether or not the project's been completed, but it's usually 90 days from the last date you did any work. Um, then DC is also 90 days from the last day that you did any work. So you, you, you might be hearing the, the commonality here, which is if you're done with the project, then you really don't want to be waiting. If you're done with your work on the project, then the clock starts ticking at that point. Right. Whereas if you're still working, you might have a little more time. But um, and, 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 and correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, if you're still working, you also have some leverage, right? Like on, on, on some level. If you're still working, your leverage is pay me or I stop working. Yeah. Well, yes, but uh, we usually recommend against stopping work because there's usually going to be a provision in the contract that says that even if there's a dispute, you have to keep doing the work. Right. Right. And even if there's not, 
it's really important that the contractor controls the work that's within their scope. And just because the other side, let's say the other side saying, uh, you have to do this, it's part of your original scope. And they, you know, the contractor knows that they're right. This is not part of the original scope. This is definitely a change order. But you know what, you should probably do it anyway, because if you don't do it, then the upstream contractor, the owner, whoever it is, they're going to have someone else do that work. And then they're going to hit you with the bill for it. And you're, you're going to have to figure out who's right eventually, whether it's a court or an arbitrator or the parties just kind of work it out in settlement. But they're going to hit you with a bill that might be a lot bigger when you know you could have done the work for a fraction of that amount. So when you do the work yourself, you control the costs a lot better. Um, and you've got a larger claim now um, that you can assert for, for payment. Right. Wow. Okay. So, you know, my, my take is as, and I'll just speak for the, the trade contractors uh, or the downstream contractors, as you've been uh, calling them, I'll, I'll, I'll go with that here for a minute. What I always recommend is that the, the, on, on day one, after you were supposed to be paid, you should be uh, finding out what's going on. That's all. <laughs> Simply just finding out what should be going on. For, and in fact, go rewind back to the moment that you submitted that invoice. Uh, directly after submitting that invoice, and we're talking days, not weeks. Directly after submitting that invoice, you should be confirming that it was approved. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all these are just ways to to sort of keep keep you from finding yourself in situations where you you've been not paid for a long time on something that you know the, the, and the, the further out that gets to your point there depending on if you've stopped work there are actually ramifications on whether you can even get uh you, you know any satisfaction on that you can even get paid on that um uh but also i i think just fundamentally like what it's going to do is surface conversations about problems potentially while you still have the ability to do something about it is that it sounds like you agree but i, I I'll, I'll toss that over you know to your um what's your view on that yeah well i think it's important that you create an overall project record and protecting the project record is very important um, when the terms of the contract are less favorable to you because you want the facts to be on your side as much as possible and if you're talking about something a year ago, it's like, well, yeah, me and the superintendent for the GC had this conversation. And he definitely approved that work. It's like, well, if you didn't write it down, then it's hard to say it happened. People's memories change. You're, now things are hinging on the credibility of, of your project manager or someone else as a witness. So it's really important you create this project record. And that's true for both changes to the work, but also the expectation of payment. So when you're sending frequent emails or even a, a letter from the owner of the company saying, hey, guys, we're 45 days past due. We really need to get this paid. You're protecting yourself with that project record. Uh, and I think that's an important aspect of it. I think that's just one of those many little things like you, you talked about, Chad, you know, like confirming the payment application has been received or confirming that it's been approved. You know, just little things like that that you can do to create a, a good record for your for your company. Yeah. And, and, um, man just demonstrates how you, th you're a hundred percent. I think that makes total sense to me. And it almost barely enters into my reasoning for doing it. <laughs> you know, my reasoning for doing it is like, if there's a problem you want to know, you want to know immediately, you don't want to find that out, you know, 60 days later and be like, wait a minute, why haven't we been paid on that? You reach out and they say, well, you, your invoice was wrong in this area, in this area, in this area, and mm -hmm. now, you know, and and now you've and now you've actually because at the end of the day, uh, what what I think we should strive for is to create open, transparent, healthy kinds of you know relationships with the everyone we're working with. I we shouldn't want there to be conflict or or you know, contention. And so, and, and, and therefore I think it's incumbent upon everybody to take steps to prevent that. And, and communication is the key. Um, and then also, yeah, you need a record if things get bad. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> Just, and you can, right. And you can make that record in a way that's not adversarial. Right. You can do it in a way. I mean, 
your contract literally requires you to provide notice of any changes on site that you come across. You have to notify the owner. Or if you're a sub, you have to notify the GC to notify the owner. Like they have to know about that so they can react. Uh, so you're just doing what you're supposed to do under the contract and you can do it in a very professional manner. Yep. Uh, but it's also very important to protect your company and also yep. to kind of set expectations of the relationship of your partnership with the upstream contractor or uh, entity that you're dealing with um, that, hey, we need to get paid on time. We're not going to just stand for waiting 120 days for our invoices to get approved and get payment. That's not OK. Yep. Um, so so let, we've heard a lot in the past year about changes happening in 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 the mid-atlantic region at least with uh pay when paid pay if paid can you give us a crash course of what this all means and what the latest changes are yeah so um pay with pay if paid and pay when paid are two slightly different concepts that sometimes get conflated um pay if paid means that i don't if i don't get paid then you downstream contractor, I have no obligation to pay you for that particular work. So it's a, and there usually has to be strong language in there that's very specific. The magic words have to be used. Usually it's a condition precedent. Payment downstream, is, uh, pay, sorry, payment from the owner is a condition precedent for the GC to pay the subcontractor. So yep. if there's never any payment then there by the owner to the GC, then the GC doesn't have to pay the sub for that work. Pay yep. when paid means uh, within a reasonable time. We don't have to do it. We don't. If we don't get paid, then we don't have to pay you at this time. But after a certain amount of time, and no one knows exactly when that is, uh, there's going to be an expectation that it has to get paid and a legal obligation at some point. Um, now, as far as the trends, well, there are courts. Uh, there are some courts that have, or sorry, there's some states that have said that we're not going to allow these um, contingent payment clauses uh, to be enforceable. A lot of courts will enforce them um, because, you know, parties are expected to be able to contract freely. They're all sophisticated commercial entities and you can abide by the terms that you agree to. But some courts have said, well, we think this is so unfair um, that we're not going to enforce it. And some states have actually said that we're not going to allow this as a practice in the industry because it's so unfair. And right now there's roughly, I think last I checked, there's about a dozen states that have said that contingent payment clauses are actually void as against public policy, or they have some way of saying that those are not allowed. And um, actually Virginia is the most recent entrant to that new trend. Um, just last year, Virginia passed a law that took effect as of January 1st, 2023, for any contract signed on or after that date, that pay if paid is no longer permitted in Virginia. Um, and that's, of course, having ripple effects uh, throughout the, uh, the local industry here. Everyone's still trying to figure out how to react to that. Um, it's not unheard of over here on the East Coast. Uh, North Carolina and South Carolina also have uh, similar prohibitions. Um, but it's a big deal. And, you know, our, our GC clients are trying to figure out, uh, you know, how to deal with this in, in Virginia because it puts a lot more pressure on them. Well, yeah, it, it's they're, they're shouldering. This is a it's such a challenging topic, to, uh, you know, for, for from my perspective. G general contractors are shouldering an undue burden there if they are on the hook to pay subcontractors regardless of whether the owner pays them I, it, there's but i mean i but i it's simultaneously i'm happy that the subcontractors gain a level of protection because th they're they're the ones who are extending all of the you know all all of the the fun, the funding to on materials and labor. I mean, they're the ones that are shouldering this burden, and to not be paid absolutely puts them out of business. And we see it happen far too often, where a, a good trade contractor is, uh, you, you know, on tilt because they're not being paid. Uh, so, so on one level, I'm glad that that has 
a record, you know, that that shouldn't occur on the, on the other end, I'm like, who's holding the owner accountable? <laughs> you know, like when, when, when does, which law holds the owner accountable? How do we make that happen? Um, and, and do, are there any trends toward, are there any trends toward, you know, pushing the responsibility further up the chain? Well, the, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great question, and it's a question that different people are answering in different ways as we speak right now. Um, I mean, it's a statutory risk-shifting mechanism, and it's moving the risk a little bit upstream towards the GC, um, but the owner already has risk. If it's a private project and the subs are not getting paid, the owner can always have a lien filed on it, whether it's by the GC or by one of the subs or whoever else is allowed to under that state's law. So the owner always has an interest in making sure that that doesn't happen. And they'll try to protect themselves by having, you know, lien waivers and things like that. Um, but the, uh, the GCs need to um, probably adjust their language in their contracts a bit to um, maybe they were giving more favorable terms in the past to owners because uh, they wanted to be a good trade partner. They wanted to have a good working relationship. Uh, and maybe they want to drive a harder bargain now on some of those contract terms that keep a little more risk on the owner. Um, you know, they, it might be that they they do the same kind of risk shifting behavior with uh, their practices with the owner, where they just are a little tougher about um, prompt payment um, with the owner. I've heard of more creative ideas, people talking about like owners having to post their own bonds, things like that. But um, you know, that's certainly interesting. Is a is a subcontractor who is being told by the GC that they, the reason that they're not being paid is that the GC has not been paid. Is a subcontractor potentially jeopardizing their relationship with the GC by putting a lien on the building? Well, you can jeopardize your relationship with the other party for for any reason. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's always some kind of, that, that's always an issue, but the contract does require you to be paid. And the law says that you can't use that as an excuse anymore. Uh, now, you know, it's interesting the the lien is actually a way in, at least in DC and Maryland to get around pay of pay, because you can still lien a project, even with a pay of paid law, um, or, you know, pay of paid being enforceable yep. in that jurisdiction. So you can always get around it that way. It just um, doesn't put the pressure on the GC. It puts the pressure on the owner. That's right. That's right. But, 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 you know, I guess what I'm saying is if you're, a, if you're a subcontractor and you're sitting there and you're sort of saying, you know, we're 120 days out on, uh, you know, a, a change order that's equivalent to 20% of the contract value that I had on this project. And the general contractors telling me that they can't get this thing approved by the owner. Am, am I committing a, a kind of business suicide by putting a lien on the building? In your yeah. experience, is it that is it that potentially damaging? Yeah, it, it is potentially. And it's part of the tough calculus that contractors have to take. So if they've got a smaller contract balance amount, they might decide, all right, let's just work this out through the claims process and through the negotiation process. And we can always just file a lawsuit, you know, a year or so down the line. But if you wait too long, you're letting your lien rights or your bond rights lapse and that's right. dangerous. Um, and you don't want to just be filing liens on every project. Right. Are, but of some people that do that, um, I personally would not recommend that because I, I think that you really have your, your future business relationships. It goes are. to reputational damage, as yes. you mentioned before. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It, it, it's, um, I, I really think that, you know, I've, and I've seen this in one or two different situations where the, where the, the subcontractor will actually go to the general contractor and say, listen, um, I'm hearing you and you're telling me that there's no way you can get me paid. I, you know, I'm about to put a lien on the building, but I want to make sure that that doesn't come as a surprise to you. Um, and I want to make sure that that's not going to, you know, cost us our future relationship. And, and I've actually heard that conversation go far better than expected because in a lot of situations, the general contractor kind of looks both ways and says, do it. 
Yeah, you know? yeah. No, the, the heads up is a great way to handle that because they everybody understands it's a business, and you know you got to pay your own employees and for the materials, and you're out of pocket for that. So they they understand that, and you know if, if they see it coming, then you know they have to kind of deal with it like that. Yeah, and 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 I think you know what what I have found in in you know watching a lot of those conversations you know, from the from a third from the from a perch right from a third party remove. What I have found is that um, the vast majority of subcontractors, or I'm sorry, general contractors, are are not the reason that the sub's not being paid. It's it it's almost always if the GC is not paying the sub, it's because the owner's not paying the GC, and and the GC has no interest in making that sub's life painful unless that sub is in some way not upholding their end of the bargain. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it, and it can get messy. You know, it, there can be kind of the things that the sub didn't do great and they, yep. you know, then they're fighting over whether or not there's a justifiable back charge. You know, it, it can get complex pretty quickly. Uh, but yeah, a lot of times the owner is the one kind of holding the bag and sometimes the owners aren't as um, sophisticated within the construction space and um, getting them up to speed on some of the practices of the industry is a challenge for the GC as well. Right. <laughs> Right. Totally. Yeah. I, I, I can, I can imagine it. And, and in fact, I've seen that too. Um, I can't believe I could talk about construction law for 30 minutes and totally forget what time it was. Uh, Jackson, this has been a lot of fun. I want to toss it over to Stacy to see what questions we might have to add on uh, specific uh, before we, before we jump off. Yeah. I have three quick questions for you. Hopefully we can get through them. Um, I can, like Casey had a great question. Pay if paid is not enforceable in Virginia, but some area GCs are putting in their contract that the venue for legal issues will be in Maryland. What advice do you offer subs when presented with a subcontract for a project in Virginia with the venue as Maryland? Well, so that's just a venue provision. Um, and you know that may or may not be enforceable depending on the circumstances but that doesn't mean that just because you're a maryland court maryland would still you know could still apply virginia law so venue shifting provisions can be different from choice of law provisions and i think that might be what ike is getting at with that that question so so if i if i could say this maybe in a different way and jackson you tell me if i got it it's we're kind of saying like the laws of virginia still apply regardless of whether you're in a court in maryland However, in a court in Maryland, you may bump into a judge that is more, um, you know, whatever, more versed in, you know, maybe more lenient toward that. Is that is that right or correct that? Well, it, no, it, it could be that. It could be that the, um, the, the GC in that situation is just trying to give themselves an argument that um, the Virginia prohibition on pay of pay doesn't apply uh, because we're in Maryland. But I would, you know, it's a new statute, so we don't know uh, how courts are going to interpret it, how that Maryland judge is going to interpret it versus uh, a Virginia judge. Uh, but, you know, that's, uh, you know, I, I would expect that even if there is a choice of law set provision saying that Maryland law will apply to this contract, I think there's still an argument that the uh, Virginia, because it's a Virginia project, that pay of paid applies. Uh, but, you know, maybe a judge would disagree with that. It, it kind of comes down to how they interpret laws and, you know, laws when they're written have to be interpreted by, by judges and applied to different sets of facts. Yep. Um, so what percent of cases make it to litigation? Um, I would say, uh, I mean, what's, what's our starting point? I mean, I'll just, I'll just assume that we're, we, we have a dispute over payment or something like that. Um, and I'll often get pulled in, um, you know, not too late in the dispute just to try to um, help resolve things. Maybe I'll um, be more behind the scenes or maybe I'll step in and send like a demand letter or something. Once it gets to that point, um, I would say actually, more than half of the time it gets worked out without a lawsuit having to be filed. Um, and, and sometime, and a lot of times you'll file the lawsuit and things will settle right away if the dollars right. make sense. Yeah. Um, the general rule of thumb, once something, once a lawsuit gets filed is that roughly 90% of all cases settle before going to trial. 
Um, and sometimes I've had cases settle on the courthouse steps. I had a trial up in, um, up in Northern Maryland a few weeks ago. It was a jury trial that settled on like the fourth day of the trial. Uh, so you'll see that happening as well. Um, cases settle all the time, and it's usually in parties' uh, best interest, their business interest to control their own destiny. And even a deal that is not ideal is better than one where you have a lot of risk and a lot of uncertainty. How long do the cases usually drag out? Uh, it could, I mean, once you file a lawsuit, I'd say the general rule of thumb could be a year or two, but you know, sometimes you're in arbitration. A lot of construction contracts require arbitration, which honestly is not a terrible way to do it because it's usually less expensive. You have to pay a little more money for the arbitrators, um, but you're, and you, you're probably gonna have a shorter discovery schedule. It's gonna be a little more targeted. And one of the important things is the arbitrator you pick, um, you can select someone that knows construction law. And yeah. that means that you're not spending a lot of time educating a judge about construction law and whew, educating a jury about construction law. That's that's an uphill battle right <laughs> there. I mean, jury, juries are smart. They get things, but you're going to have to put in a lot of work to educate them. And that yeah. you know, that's just more resources you got to use on that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, final question would be, can you discuss the characteristics of a good case versus a bad case? I would say one of the most important things you can do, and we, Chad and I were talking about this early on, um, is what the thing that strengthens your case the most is having the best uh, documentation. So you want to make sure that you're you know, following the terms of your contract and you're documenting that you're doing that. And if the other party is trying to push you around in ways that are outside of the terms of the contract, well, you're going to look a lot better by documenting that you're trying to stay within the contract uh, because you can kind of cloak yourself in the protection of the contract terms and its procedures. Um, and also you can prove that whatever you're doing, you know, if you're writing it, then presumably it's good for you. Well, if you're better at documenting what's going on, then your side of the case is going to sound stronger when someone else who's neutral is looking at it one, two, three, five years later. Um, so that's always helpful for you. Consistent, uh, reliable project documentation is is critical. Yep, and and and, and, and you know, not just for some projects, do it for all. Yeah. <laughs> you know, not, just, not just don't start doing it once things get a little dicey. You know, you should always right. be doing it. That's that's I, I hear that all the time. You know, where I'll be like, you better start documenting. I'm like, you better should have been documenting this yeah. whole time, guys. Like, that, that, that now is not the time to start. Uh, it's, it actually almost in some ways looks worse when all of a sudden you start doing it. But, uh, anyway, uh, Jackson, it's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much for, for, you know, bringing value to our audience and, uh, providing a really interesting, uh, a discussion, uh, certainly for us. So, um, we, we were uh, glad to have you and look forward to having you on again in the future. Thanks a lot, guys. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Have a great one. You too. All right, Stacy. let's talk a little bit about uh, some housekeeping items before we wrap up. So I think um, the first thing that I want to uh, call out, and I know we've talked about it a couple of different times, but the, you know, it is uh, fast approaching. We will be running the live NAWIC conference podcast uh, uh, on uh, May 5th, Friday, May 5th, around midday. So keep keep your eyes peeled for um, that invite coming across, uh, whether you can join, uh, it, you know, if you can be at the NAWIC conference in DC, please do. I think that would be awesome. We'd love to see you in person. Uh, but if you can't, uh, you'll have an opportunity to tune in live, get a little bit of a feel for what's going on at, uh, at, at that conference. Is that, is that right? Stacy, everything that I just said sound accurate. That's accurate. <laughs> awesome. Good. So I look forward to, uh, to, to that opportunity. And, and if, you know, if you're there, who knows, we might just drag you onto the screen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, sorry, that's not a, don't, don't let that deter you from coming. <laughs> if that, only, if you want to. <laughs> only if you want to, that's exactly right. Um, uh, next week we've got, uh, episode 50, which also wraps up this season. Uh, and episode 50 is with Phil Key, who is the president of Rupert Landscape. Uh, he's going to be on talking about uh, 
actually a bunch of different things, but I think the main theme is going to be how to operationalize your culture, how to take, how to take something like a company's core values and what we're really all about and what we, you know, what we try to be and turn that into um, actually, you know, a, a, a daily set of habits that, that every flows and, and it isn't just a bunch of BS. So uh, Rupert's done an incredible job of that. And, and I think, you know, very few people uh, better to talk about it than Phil. Yeah. So that'll be cool. Look forward to having that. And, uh, and then finally, um, you know, as always, we will, um, you know, hope to hear from you on, you know, getting added to our mailing list, email Stacy at Stacy H at steel That's two M's.com. Uh, and, uh, uh, obviously we're building our next season, mm-hmm. which will start August 1st ish. Um, let me see. Ish, right? Ish is okay. August 1st. Yes, you're correct. All right. We already have guests lined up for August, um, some for October even. So September, we're looking at um, a lot of new topics for the season. Um, we try to do new topics each season. So it's not the same repetitive thing. So a lot of- Even if you don't have like an idea for a, for a guest, an idea for a topic, we'd love to hear. Yeah. Anything that we missed so far that you haven't heard would be great. Agreed. All right, cool. Well, uh, I think that does it. Stacy. thank you. I, 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 it appears I made it through without any glitches. Yeah. I will give five points to the Hyatt. Five points <laughs> to, to, to Hyatt for having um, good yeah. streaming uh, Wi-Fi. So, all right, Stacy. have a great week. We'll see you next you week. Too. See, ya. see you, everyone. Bye-bye.